Hi class, welcome to lesson number two. Lesson number one was just about getting our feet wet, learning a few basic definitions, asking the question, what is astronomy and what are we studying? But the universe is huge, it's gigantic, it is super awesome and vast. And now we have to start talking about, well, where do we start in our learning? So let's start with our solar system, all those suns out there, each being their own star. And, and we want to start with everything that's surrounding our star, the sun. So we're going to begin by looking at what is around us, what is in our solar system, what is in that big, wide gravitational pull of our star, the sun. All right, so we're going to start talking about the sun, the center of our solar system. How big is it? Well, it's said to be about a million times bigger than Earth. And when we start talking about the universe, we're talking about numbers that are so huge that they're almost impossible to comprehend. So, I don't know, we're going to try to do some pictures here and some, some images to help get an idea of just how big the sun and the earth is. So we'll use a picture of a basketball and a peppercorn. Basketball is the sun, peppercorn is the earth. If you can see that tiny little peppercorn there compared to this huge sun. So this tiny little peppercorn is the satellite of the sun going around the bigger object in its orbit or the path around the sun being held by the gravity of this big thing pulling on this little thing and holding it in its gravity. So one million peppercorns fitting inside this basketball is the size. So why though does it seem that the sun is smaller? If it's a million times bigger shouldn't it take up the entire sky? Why does it look like just a fiery ball up there in, in our sky. And that's something called perspective. So as we, here's an example of a, of a game I want you to play so you can see what perspective looks like. This little ball right here is bigger than my hands and fingers. But if I bring my fingers close enough to my eye, I can make it so I can squish the ball. It's like a you deal with people. Look at their heads and you squish their heads. So I bring my fingers close enough and I can squish it. It's just a matter of perspective. Seeing my fingers aren't any bigger. They're not big enough for the ball to, to actually be able to squish it. But when I bring them close to my eyes, it appears, because my fingers are closer to my eye, they appear bigger than the basketball so I can make it look like my little fingers can squish the ball. All right. So the Earth is one million times, or the Sun is one million times bigger than the Earth. How far away is the Earth from the Sun? The distance from Sun to Earth. Well, here's the technical number. It's 92,935,700 miles away. And we might be able to grasp 5,000 miles, because we could compare that to something on Earth. We could probably grasp 700 miles, maybe from Rochester to New York City or something like that. But it's just such, 92 million is so big that we don't have anything to compare it to. It, we, it's probably safer for us, especially if people want to try to send satellites out there, to look at the sky in awe and wonder and say that that sun is really very far away. So the distance, 92 million miles, 92 million and 935,700 miles. Uh, another thing though I want to talk about is how hot is the sun? And you say, well, we're talking about the distance of the sun. Why are we talking about how hot it is? Well, it's 10,000 degrees. They say it's measured at 10,000 degrees hot. What's really interesting, though, is this 92,935,700 miles is related to the 10,000 degrees in that if we were really any closer, we'd burn up and our planet would be inhospitable. And if we were any farther, our planet would freeze. So this, this number right here, even though it's so huge, we can't comprehend it. What we can comprehend is that it's perfect. It's the perfect distance so that we're not too hot and burned up and we can live. And we're not too cold that the whole planet freezes and we die. 92 million miles, 92,935,700 miles is the perfect distance that God placed us away from the sun so that life could exist on planet Earth. Quick pause to our regularly scheduled programming to make a public service announcement or warning. Don't get all excited about the sun and go out there and try to 
pinch it with your fingers because staring at the sun can permanently cause damage to your eyeballs. Your eyes have a lens in them. And that lens, I don't know if you can see it on the board or not, focuses and concentrates sunlight so that it will actually begin to burn the back of your, uh, your, back of your eyeball and the image where it reads what you see and cause permanent damage. And uh, before you go saying, well, I looked at the sun and it didn't hurt me, I didn't feel any pain, there are no pain receptors in the back of your eyes, so you would think it doesn't hurt while it's actually doing damage and burning away. Some of you may have read the, the story that we, we covered before, the biography of Paul Brand, and how the lepers couldn't feel the damage that was being done to them, so they didn't try to protect their body. Likewise, you won't feel the damage being done to your eyes, so I'm giving you the warning, don't look at it, don't stare at it, or it will cause injury. And we'll talk somewhat about the tools that scientists use, and even how to make one yourself, to be able to observe the sun without injuring your eyes. New definition for us, revolve. It's almost the same as orbit, where one object goes around another. The difference between revolve and orbit is that orbit technically has to do with the gravitational pull and how this one thing pulls on the other and maybe makes a circular or an elliptical path. But revolve just simply means that this little peppercorn earth goes around this big huge sun. Um, sometimes you'll hear you know, a phrase like, man, Johnny's life revolves around pizza, which means Pizza is the middle and most important thing in his universe, and he all he thinks about or sees is pizza. When we talk about something revolving around something else, it's like saying it's the most important, it's the biggest, it has the most pull in someone's life, uh, or the most gravity. So, you know, if someone was self-centered, would, they would say something like, oh, they think the earth revolves around them, or they think everything revolves around them, as if they're the center of the universe, and the sun, the moon, the stars, and everyone else revolves around them as having the most gravity. But we know that's not true. Everything in our universe revolves around the sun. Let's do our next definition, the word rotate. So the Earth, not only does it revolve around the sun, but it also rotates. And so to rotate is to spin on its axis. So if this is revolve, going around the Earth in a big elliptical pattern, like a satellite in orbit or revolving, the Earth is also rotating or spinning. And an axis would be this point here and this point here. Those parts don't move because they're the, they're the axis and everything else revolves around that axis. Another way to think about it is like the axle of a car. So here's this pole that runs through from connecting wheel to wheel and as I spin these wheels they spin on their axle or axis. So what does that matter? Well, simple. The rotation of the earth or the spinning of the earth takes 24 hours and it causes our day and night while the revolving of the sun around, I'm sorry, the revolving of the earth around the sun takes 365 days, which causes the, you guessed it, the seasons. So, the revolving of the Earth around the Sun, 365 days, causes the seasons. The rotation of the Earth, 24 hours, causes day and night. We will study those more later. Alright, a couple of things that the Sun does that I want to talk about in terms of hots and colds. Uh, there's some phenomena or some activity that happens on the sun that's worth noting. Uh, the first of which I'll call it the hots are solar flares. Solar flares are almost like a volcano or a burst of energy or an eruption out of the sun that shoots out a shock wave of force and lots of particles from the sun. Uh, on the earth sometimes, maybe you've heard of the northern lights, where the earth has a gravitational pull that will take these particles as the wave comes flying towards the earth and it will take the particles and bring them to the two poles, the southern and northern pole. And it creates this multicolored shimmering lights as the particles settle back down to earth on the top and the bottom. Uh, the other thing it does too is it has a shock wave that can hit the earth and it can disrupt power, it can shut down communications and things like that. So a solar flare is a burst on the sun, a hot burst that shoots out energy into the solar system like a cosmic shock wave. Um, 
Sunspots are another phenomena that's observed on the sun, but when the sun's observed, the scientists have noticed dark black spots that sometimes appear on the sun, sometimes with more frequency, sometimes with less. So, as science does, they make observations to try to figure out what is that and what's going on. And they determined that these black spots, which are about ten times the size of Earth, or can be about ten times the size of Earth on the sun, are actually cooler spots. So if you think of like a volcano being big and orange and red and hot, that when it's cool you might see black spots on the, on, of hardened uh, rock in the, in the lava. Now I'm not saying that that's hardened on the sun, but you, the cooler spots stand out as darker. They figure maybe it might be about a 3,000 degree difference. Now they're, they're not sure, but observation is telling them that, that it may be that it's not that the parts are getting cooler, but that, is the sun, that the sun can be hotter at certain times that would make other parts relatively cooler. And so between 1645 and 1710, they made these observations that there were no sunspots in those years. That they, 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 they observed that the sun was not doing this phenomena. And that during those years, the earth was actually much cooler, like a global cooling. And so they made the correlation to say, well, there's not sunspots. Perhaps that's the sun being cooler. And it, and it affects the Earth that way. Now, however, if there's lots of sun spots, it's expected that the Earth is going to be hotter, that the sun is hotter, and that's going to radiate on the Earth, and that's how they uh, would maybe be able to predict and, and see a drought coming, or a global warming, or a, a heat coming. So, it may just be that these sun spots, and this, hot, and this cooling and hotting, or cooling and warming, is the Lord's way of regulating the temperature on the Earth. So, just some theory there, but understand that the sunspots are cooler spots on the sun, and solar flares are big hot eruptions and explosions of the sun out into the rest of the solar system. So where does the sun get all this energy, you might wonder? Well, it's a little process that I do want you to memorize the name of, called thermonuclear fusion. Thermo has to do with the word heat for thermos or thermometer. Nuclear is the center of an atom, the middle of the atom, uh, an atom being one of the smallest uh, structures in the universe. And then fusion has to do with things binding together or combining together. So there's this process happening in the sun, what's going on in the middle of atoms, where things are fusing and binding together and producing thermo or heat, lots of heat and lots of light. So this process going on in the middle of the sun is called thermonuclear fusion. And I'll give you some other resources to look at to try to understand that a little bit better if you'd like to. Otherwise, I just want you to memorize the word. Now, there's an interesting fact about this. And this the sun is getting brighter and brighter, hotter and hotter through the process of nuclear fusion. And as you may well know, there's this debate and controversy of whether the Earth is millions and billions of years old or thousands of years old. People who believe in an old, ancient Earth and evolution versus a young Earth and creation. And so the pe this is a little bit of evidence that points to the creation of the young Earth, because if the Earth was millions and billions of years old, following the pattern of how much it's growing in heat and light, the Earth, the earth would have been a cold ball, and there would have been no heat for life to be created or for life to begin evolving at, the, at those early billions and millions of years. So just something to be aware of, that because this thermonuclear fusion is getting hotter and hotter and hotter, it does give a lot of scientific evidence and facts to support a young Earth. We now come to my favorite part about discussing the sun, and that's sunlight. Uh, what color is the sun? The sun is reflecting, is emitting white light, and white light is basically all the colors of the rainbow combined together to make white light. It's bright, it's clear, it's crisp. So why do we see different colors? All the color of our universe is coming from the sun in that white light, but somehow we perceive things as different colors. Now our eyes have the ability to tell the difference between waves of light. So all of these waves are hitting us at one time, and in them are maybe orange waves, which are a long wave, and short waves would be something like blue. And so our, our eyes have the ability to discern and to tell the difference between long waves and short waves, and our brain registers that as colors. So in every object in the universe, whether it's a red rose or uh, 
a blue sky uh, or blue blue wall or brown or orange or, or blue ink all reflect and absorb different colors. Everything reflects and absorbs different wavelengths of light. So for example, this is reflecting a short blue wave. And this ink right here is reflecting those long orange waves. And it's absorbing everything else. So all the other light waves are going into there and stopping and being absorbed by this ink and the orange is reflecting back and my brain picks that up as, as color. So everything's either reflecting or absorbing light waves. Black absorbs all light so nothing comes back and it appears dark and black. Where this whiteboard reflects all the spectrum back and it appears white. So here's the age-old question. Why is the sky blue? Well, let's picture here's our Earth. And around it is a gaseous atmosphere. It means these gases, this envelope around the Earth of all these, these gases that help protect the Earth, which we'll study in the next chapter when we, get to, when we get to the Earth. But this cloud of gases that surrounds the Earth that's held in place, it reflects blue light. So that when you look in the day, all the rest of the light comes through, but the color blue bounces around on the sky and in that atmosphere and lights up the sky so it looks blue because all the blue light is being scattered around up there. Now when it comes to evening and the sun shines in like this, the blue instead of bouncing as much off of the, uh, bouncing around in the atmosphere, it tends to bounce off making it look like a red or an orange sunset or sunrise. So when the earth is high above and it's bouncing straight in, it's white light and the sky is blue, but as it gets off to the side on the horizon either way for sunrise and sunset, the blue bounces off and you see the glorious reds and oranges of a sunrise or a sunset because the blue light bounced off. So uh, that's just a little bit about the color and how the sky is blue and what color the, the light of the, the sun is. But let me ask you this question. In the sun, Black things tend to be hotter, and white things tend to be cooler, and I'm going to ask you in class why you think that is. So give it a good noodle over and see if you can think about why black objects would be hotter in the sunlight and white objects would be cooler. Alright, the last little phenomenon I want to talk about in our discussion of the sun is called a solar eclipse. And this would basically be when in the broad daylight, the sun disappears. What? How does the center of the universe, the biggest thing, the brightest thing in the sky, suddenly disappear? Well, there's this phenomenon that happens as, what's the satellite that goes around the Earth? Does anyone remember, remember the satellite? The natural satellite? The moon, right. So there's this other big ball of moon that's orbiting around the Earth in its elliptical pattern. And so, if these lights over here, maybe you can see that there's a, a little bit of a shadow there, as the moon, in the middle of the day, can come and, ro and go right between the sun and the earth. It creates a shadow on the earth as the moon gets, see right now as you're looking at my face, and the moon comes right in between me and the camera, or for your case, it's the camera and my face, and it blocks it out and then passes right on by. So there's this phenomenon that happens very, very rarely. But I can only imagine that before the satellites and before people had a good understanding of the heavens, what they must have thought when all of a sudden the sun started to darken over as a shadow came across it. But that was called a full solar eclipse. You could have a partial solar eclipse where maybe it just comes slightly across and blocks part of the view. Uh, but that's just a, I want you to be aware of a solar eclipse is when the moon passes between the earth and the sun and only for a spot because the Earth, the Moon's not that big, but only for a spot casts a shadow on Earth. And if you happen to be in that spot, your perspective is, is that the Sun just disappeared in the middle of the daytime sky. That concludes our lesson two. Uh, we covered all of the basics about the Sun that I want you to take good notes and memorize those facts, and we'll quiz on it in the next class. But I want you in this particular case to watch some of the extras, because we just touched on the concepts and the, the extras and the supplemental materials to help you get a better understanding of some of these things uh, with some better visual effects than I can produce on my home camera. So watch those if you can and we'll talk about it more in class where we'll do a couple of hands-on experiments to try to understand what some of these concepts are. 
But you did a good job being patient and going through all this material. I'll see you in class.